And and so let's start uh, the, the first talk. It's our pleasure to have Costas. Everyone knows Costas, Costas Karagiannis from, from the seminar, um, who is going to give this first series of talks for this for this year in the topic about polynomial variance of finite group schemes. So Costas, you can you can start. Uh, thank you, Agile. And uh, before I start, I don't want to say much, but um, I would definitely like um, to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Agelos, Makis, Mary, Yanis, Dimitris, uh, and to say that uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor uh, for me to be um, like to start this uh, new format of Gantt seminar uh, talks. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, top Costas, before that, we also want to thank you being the first one because we know that you had to prepare all these talks, three, the three talks, and that takes time. Okay, I forgot uh, to mention that. We also okay. thank you a lot. Thank you, thank you, Angela. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me start uh, by saying that this is reminding the audience that this is a series of uh, three talks. Uh, on invariant theory of finite group schemes. Uh, and as it is it customary for uh, classic, uh, you know, 50 minute, one hour talks, usually one spends the first uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, setting up the problem and introducing the concepts uh, that will be used. Uh, now, if you uh, extend this to a three hour, if you scale it to these three hour lectures, uh, this means that uh, most uh, of what I will talk about today uh, is introductory. Uh, so maybe I want to apologize to the experts in the audience um, that uh, if you know what a finite group scheme is and what its representations are, um, you will not learn much uh, today. Uh, I will rather uh, set up my motivation and my um, uh, concepts so that I can use them in the subsequent two lectures. Uh, so uh, let me start by a prologue, a prelude uh, on classical invariant theory that dates back um, centuries. Um, and maybe the first example in the literature um, is if one considers uh, actions of the symmetric group in, let's say for simplicity, three letters, permutations of the elements one, two, three, on a polynomial ring on three variables. Uh, now, every uh, permutation uh, in the symmetric group gives rise to an automorphism of the polynomial ring, right? Uh, by mapping a polynomial in the three variables uh, to the polynomial we obtain by just permuting the variables uh, as is forced by the chosen permutation, okay? Uh, and the terminology uh, is that the polynomial is called symmetric or invariant uh, if it remains unchanged for all the permutations uh, in the symmetric group, okay? Uh, so it is very easy to check that the polynomial like uh, X plus Y plus Z uh, is invariant uh, because no matter how I flip the variables, I still get the same polynomial, you know? Uh, whereas the polynomial X, Y plus Z squared is not invariant because if, for example, I interchange X with Z and I leave Y uh, unaffected, uh, I get the polynomial zy plus x squared, which is clearly not the same. Uh, so a classical theorem, which uh, dates back definitely to, to, to Newton in some other form, I'm not really uh, certain uh, who to credit it to, maybe someone in the audience knows, um, is that uh, every invariant polynomial, every symmetric polynomial can be built from these three polynomials, x plus y plus z, xy plus yz plus zx, and xyz, in the sense that invariant polynomials can be written as polynomial expressions in terms of these polynomials. So somehow linear combinations of powers of these polynomials. Okay. Uh, and the same picture carries on to another example. Uh, for example, uh, the cyclic group of order four. Okay, uh, let's take the presentation of the cyclic group in terms of matrices. Uh, 
uh, and consider the action on a polynomial ring in two variables uh, by matrix multiplication. So for example, the matrix negative one, zero, zero, negative one uh, acts on a polynomial by just negating the variable. Okay. Uh, so a polynomial that is invariant under this action, for example, x1 squared plus x2 squared is invariant because all I do with these matrices is either negate or flip the variables. And analogously to the previous result, it's a very simple exercise in undergraduate algebra, really, uh, to show that any polynomial which is invariant can be built from these three polynomials, x1 squared plus x2 squared, x1 squared, x2 squared, uh, and x1 cubed, x2 minus x1, x2 cubed. In the same sense as before, that I can write it as a linear combination of powers of this polynomial. So to set up the problem in its uh, full generality, uh, if I have an arbitrary group which acts on a polynomial ring over an arbitrary field, no assumptions. Okay. Uh, you can think of such actions coming from actions on the variables, okay, by playing around with the variables. Uh, then the ring of invariance uh, is classically known uh, to be the ring of elements which are fixed under uh, the action of all group elements. And classic invariant theory was motivated by the question of trying to describe the ring of invariance as explicitly as possible. Okay. We did this in the previous two examples. Okay. And what I have here in the green uh, box is a restatement uh, of what I had before. Uh, every polynomial invariant under the symmetric group uh, is a polynomial expression in these three forms that we saw. Okay. And every polynomial invariant under the cyclic group is a polynomial expression in these three forms. Okay. So the general question is whether or not we can generalize this fact uh, to all groups and all polynomials. So can we always find some elements in our polynomial ring such that the invariants are a polynomial expression in these elements. This is an existent statement. Okay. Um, and if we can, then what can we say about these polynomials? Can we find them completely? This is probably too much to ask for, but can we at least say something possibly about their degrees, for example? Um, now, I'm telling you that this is an interesting problem, right? Uh, but of course, uh, who am I to convince you like that? So to further motivate this, these problems, I'm going to be uh, using the technique of invoking the authority, right? So I'm going to go back uh, to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, the Second International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris uh, in the 1900s, uh, the speakers famously invited one of the, if not the greatest mathematician of that era, uh, David Hilbert, um, to present a list of the most important problems uh, that he thought would shape research, uh, mathematical research in the 20th century. Uh, so Hilbert gave a talk uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, but not surprisingly, at the time, the mathematical community was uh, predominantly male, right? Uh, my research said that uh, in the Congress of the 1900s, there were no women speakers, not even giving contributing talks, okay? Uh, so uh, the mathematical community was presented with some questions. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture from uh, ICM in Paris, but I got this picture from the very first ICM in 1893, there are several famous people. I think that this guy in the middle with a white beard is Felix Klein, for example. Um, so one of Hilbert's problems, uh, problem number 14, uh, 
obviously you don't expect me to talk about the Riemann hypothesis or uh, calculus of variations, right? Uh, is exactly the problem I present. Uh, so if we have a group acting on a polynomial ring over a field, are the invariants finitely generated as a K algebra? And just as a comment, the definition of being finitely generated as a K algebra, one of the equivalent characterizations is exactly the condition uh, that I showed you in the first slide, that it can be written uh, as a polynomial uh, in some elements of it. Okay. Now, the community at the moment did not have a confused answer. Uh, Hilbert himself had worked out some special cases. I think the case of SLN, the special linear group, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and some other people like Gordon uh, had done other cases. But the general case was wide open, uh, and uh, really there was no idea how to approach this problem. Uh, so Hilbert had to wait uh, for about uh, 15 years. So here is, is Hilbert a bit older. Uh, when back in his home institution in Göttingen, um, a newly uh, appointed, very talented young professor, uh, not professor, uh, researcher, uh, had just joined uh, the faculty. Uh, and that talented mathematician happened to be a woman uh, going by the name of Emily, Emily Nether. Uh, and Nether actually uh, gave an answer to Hilbert's problem that if the group acting is finite, then the invariants are always finite. But of course, Hilbert knew uh, that the characteristic of the ground field plays a major role uh, in representation theory. Maske had already published his uh, famous theorem, uh, I think, uh, at the end of the 1890s, 1898, something like this. Uh, and neither at the moment, uh, at the point, could prove this only for the complex theory. Okay. Uh, so Hilbert had to wait another 10 years, uh, and here is the picture of Nether I found, maybe it's a bit older than 10 years later, but uh, Nether generalized the result and proved finite generation uh, over an arbitrary field, 1996. Uh, so this settled the first question, the question of finite generation. Uh, but of course, in the slide I showed you in the beginning, uh, there was also uh, a second question, uh, which asked, what can we say about the invariants, right? Uh, and this is a picture I got, the, the dates don't match, 1926, 1932, but this was uh, the ICM in Zurich uh, where we had the first plenary woman speaker and surprisingly, not surprisingly, I think you can guess uh, who it were. Uh, it was actually never herself, right? Uh, so in her uh, original paper in 1926, Emily had proved that the degrees of the generators are always bounded by the ordinary. Okay. Uh, but Hilbert being persistent, and here is Hilbert again, another 10 years later, um, insisted on asking whether her result was characteristic. And unfortunately for the moment, uh, uh, Nether could not generalize the material, the mathematics that were available at the moment were definitely insufficient to generalize the result to arbitrary characteristics. Okay, so now to switch from this uh, slightly silly comic book type talk <clears throat> to an actual mathematical talk uh, and summarize the previous slides, we are in the context of a finite group acting on a polynomial ring over an arbitrary field. Um, we say that the invariants are finitely generated as a K-algebra, not as a K-module, right? This is the distinction between uh, a finite type and a finite algebra. Uh, if we can find polynomials um, such that every invariant is a polynomial expression in the elements, okay? Equivalently, and important uh, in what will come when we will discuss the regularity um, of invariants, um, this can be rephrased into uh, the fact that there is a surjection from a polynomial ring in as many variables as the generators uh, onto the ring of invariants. This is just by evaluating uh, the zi's uh, to the x. Okay. 
and Nether's result from 1926, uh, actually her two results, uh, say that um, invariants are finitely generated over any field uh, and over the complex numbers, um, the de degrees of the generators are bounded by the order. Now, the conclusive answer to Hilbert's problem was given in 1959 uh, when Nagata gave a counterexample of a group uh, which is necessarily, of course, uh, infinite, uh, whose invariants are not finitely generated. And then this was uh, somehow refined by Bert Otaro in 2008, uh, who really gave a precise characterization of when and why this happened. So we have a complete settlement of the finite generation question. Uh, what remained open was uh, bounding the degrees of the generators. Uh, and this had to wait for almost one century uh, for David Mumford and his students to develop the geometric counterpart of invariant theory. One of his students being James Fogarty, who in 2000, independently with Peter Fleischmann, proved that Nether's bound, the order of the group, applies uh, to any field as long as the characteristic does not divide the order. Okay. Still in the ordinary uh, representation theory uh, context. Uh, and the final settlement of the question was given by Peter Simons in 2011 uh, in a really celebrated result um, in a paper in the Annals where he proved uh, that in the modular representation <clears throat> case, uh, the invariants are generated by polynomials whose degrees are bounded by the number of variables times the order of the group times. Nether's bound was known to fail um, in that context, uh, and this bound was a conjecture uh, that was finally proved by Peter Simon. Uh, so I think this concludes the overview of the two questions I posed. Uh, and it is natural in mathematics, possibly one of the driving forces between research is to try to seek for generalization, right? Uh, so we can generalize in several different directions. Uh, we can replace the ground field by an arbitrary Noverian ground field, so polynomials over an Noverian field. Uh, we can replace the object we are acting on uh, by some arbitrary commutative algebra instead of a polynomial ring. Or what we will be doing in these lectures, we can replace the object that acts um, by a finite group scheme. These are the three generalizations. Uh, and here I decided to put a fourth point, uh, which I know is interesting to some people in the audience, which is more homological or categorical. Um, and probably the most interesting of all is by viewing the invariants as a left exact functor, uh, one can generalize by considering a tri derived functor, which gives group homology or group scheme homology. Uh, and one can ask these questions um, in the context of group homology. Okay? Even finite generation. Uh, for uh, over an arbitrary Noverian ring for finite group schemes was proven uh, a few months ago uh, by Wilbert van der Kallen. I don't want to, to spend time on that yet. If I have time towards the end, I'll try to squeeze 10, 15 minutes discussing about this topic. Okay, so I'm moving to the second part uh, or maybe the first part after the, the introduction, uh, which will be uh, a discussion on Hopf algebras. Uh, again, a reminder that we are still in the analog of the first 10, 15 minutes of um, a one hour lecture. So uh, my apologies to the experts. Uh, I didn't say earlier, of course, feel free to interrupt me at any point, right? If this is a, there is any question or any comment, um, I can't see the chat, but I'm sure the, the, the other people can do so. Um, so now let me talk about Hopf algebras, okay, to define group schemes. And let me introduce them using, again, a very simple example, the example of the cyclic group of orbiter. Okay. Uh, so if we start with a cyclic group, like the generator T, 
powers of t, uh, then we can form a vector space with basis the group G, okay, denoted by kg, just taking formal linear combinations of the group elements. And the operations that originally define the group, multiplication and identity, uh, endow the kg with a structure of a k-algebra. So we have a multiplication and a unit. Uh, and it's very easy, very well known. Again, I'm representation theory 101, uh, that the group algebra is isomorphic uh, as a ring to a quotient of the polynomial ring by the polynomial t to the n minus 1. Uh, however, the group has more structure, right? The group has an inverse, which is not evident in that description yet. Plus, we know from representation theory that group algebras have also an augmentation now, uh, which is again not evident in that definition. Okay. So where do these come from? Okay. To see where they come from, we dualize. So we consider the dual vector space, just as a vector space, which I'm going to denote by k square bracket g. So homomorphisms from the group algebra to the ground. If one dualizes uh, a basis element in the group algebra, okay, uh, then they get maps from the group to K. Okay, and dualization, uh, by definition, right, EI evaluated at T to the J is the Kronecker delta between I and J. Uh, so these elements um, can be multiplied. Essentially, they form orthogonal idempotence, if you wish. Uh, so EI times EI is itself, EI squared is itself, and EI J is zero. Uh, and then the sum of the EI is one. So we get a K-algebra structure on this k square back G, uh, which can be very easily seen to be isomorphic to a product of the ground field as many times as the order of the group. Okay? This is what you would probably like to call a separable algebra, or more appropriately for the purposes of these lectures, an etal algebra. Okay. Uh, so now we have assigned to each finite group two rings, uh, the group algebra and what I will be calling from now on the coordinate, both of which have a multiplication and a unit, but one is dual of the other. So when I dualize the multiplication, so when I dualize um, the group algebra, right, the multiplication gives rise to a dual map, which goes in the other direction from the dual of kg, k square bracket g, to the tensor product, the dual. And I call this a co multiplicator. When I dualize the unit, I get a map in the other direction, which we call the co-unit. And conversely, when I dualize the algebra structure of the coordinate ring, I get a co-algebra structure on the group algebra. Okay. Finally, we have one extra map, which comes from the group inverse, okay, which literally takes a group element G, the G to the negative one, okay, to its inverse, and then dualizing, it gives a map on coordinate rings, and these maps are called antipodes. So these two K algebras have extra structure, and this is simply the definition of a Hopf. So a Hopf algebra is a vector space equipped with two interacting structures, an algebra structure, multiplication and unit, a co-algebra structure, co-multiplication and co-unit, plus an antipode. And by definition, the dual vector space to a Hopf algebra is also a Hopf algebra, right? Because multiplication becomes co-multiplication, unit, co-unit, and then co-co-multiplication, double dual gives you the origin. Okay. Of course, there is a bunch of compatibility properties. Okay, some diagrams that I have not drawn. But this is exactly what you would expect 
that these two structures need to interact nicely. Okay. So for a finite group, both the group algebra and the coordinate range are half friends. And importantly for what will follow, the group can be recovered from the group algebra by just taking its basis, but the group can also be recovered from the coordinate plane by looking at the spectrum of its primate. If you look at how this coordinate ring is defined, the, the fact that it's in a tau k algebra, it's very simple. So the punchline here is that these three objects, g, kg, and k square bracket q, one can determine the other. So this allows me to give the general abstract definition of a group scheme from the algebraic perspective. Okay. So before I give the definition, I mean, online talks are a bit uh, dry in the sense that uh, you, know, you can't see interaction, but uh, maybe I want to share very quickly a funny story. I was visiting my parents last week back in Athens uh, and uh, I was working on this presentation. I did not have my laptop and I was working I, from Overleaf uh, from my father's laptop. And, um, you know, my, I Googled the definition of group scheme just to see something I wanted. And you know how Google's algorithms work. Uh, you don't get the same results, right? Depending on what you have done. Well, my father is a lawyer. So when I Googled group scheme definition, what I got is that group scheme means a scheme or arrangement which provides for entering into one or more policies, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share. Of course, this is not, uh, this is probably what group scheme means to a lawyer. Um, but for us, um, group schemes are uh, just prime spectra of hop algebra. Okay. So I hope algebra, uh, H, uh, which is assumed to be finite dimensional, uh, commutative. Um, it means that it's in particular a commutative ring. So I can do the spec construction. And the spectrum of a commutative uh, Hopf algebra is what I define to be a group scheme. Okay. Uh, I will denote this Hopf algebra H by K square bracket Q. Okay. Uh, I will denote its dual by KG and call it the group algebra, even though it does not come from an honest group. Okay, just modeling what happens uh, in the case of finite groups. Um, and the picture that we were seeing before, this interaction between the two hop structures, I have it summarized here, color coding maps that are dual to each other, right? So the green multiplication on the group algebra gives me the green co-multiplication on the coordinate ring. Um, the red unit or identity on the group, sorry, on the coordinate ring gives me the red co-unit or augmentation map uh, in the group algebra and so on. Okay. Uh, I want to stress uh, that these are more general uh, than the group algebra and coordinate ring of a finite group that we saw. Right? I'm starting with an abstract of algebra, uh, not assuming that it comes from a group. Okay. Uh, and as examples, okay, as examples, the first one is the one that we have seen. Uh, from now on, I'm going to call, call my actual finite groups, uh, use the letter gamma to distinguish between my group schemes, which I will be calling G. Uh, so, I have used the word co-commutative, right? The, the, the group algebra is not commutative. Co-commutative just means that it's co-multiplication, uh, which is given by G mapping to G tensor G. You can change the order of the image of the two arguments uh, and still you get the same output, okay? Which reflects the fact that the dual is commutative. The co-unit is the augmentation map, the antipode is the inversion. Uh, however, another class of examples, uh, which is really one of the reasons why we're doing this whole thing, uh, comes from Lie algebras. So if one starts with a Lie algebra, uh, then its universal enveloping algebra okay, is definitely a K algebra, but it's also a co-algebra. It has a co-structure. Okay? 
the commultiplication takes x to one tensor x plus x tensor one. And again, you can see that this is co-commutative because you can change the order uh, in the image and still get the same map. The co-unit is zero, maps every element to zero, and the antipode is the negation. So somehow this is the additive version uh, of the group. Um, and one of the motivations for studying representations of group schemes is that they somehow unify these two theories, which are um, in essence, or at least they were viewed as being something very different, right? Representations of finite groups and representations of the algebras somehow are unified under the theme of representations uh, of uh, finite groups. Okay. This is the motivation uh, for the representation theories. Um, okay, so, so far I've done everything algebraically, uh, but now I want to delve deeper into the geometric. I've defined my group schemes essentially algebraically from the representation theorists. Uh, now I'm going to define it from the algebraic geometry. So let's start with a nice category C. Don't worry about the adjectives, uh, you know, unless you're Matis. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, you can think of your category being sets, groups, topological spaces, commutative rings, affine schemes, and so on. Uh, so I can define abstractly a group object. Uh, to be an object that comes equipped with morphisms that model the group action. Okay. So a multiplication morphism, a map, E, M, an identity, here star is a terminal object in my category, and an inversion map. Okay. And I need them, I force them to satisfy the group actions uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, if you compose multiplication uh, with the identity, you know, it's like multiplying an element uh, with the identity element and it leaves the element unaffected. Uh, this is just axioms that one can write down very simply in terms of M, E, and I, which are modeled after uh, group actions. So our classical groups are group objects in the category of sets. Lie groups are group objects in the category of smooth manifolds. Maybe less trivially, but not very difficult to prove, is that your group objects in the category of groups uh, are abelian groups. Okay. Uh, this is less intuitive than the other two cases. Uh, but of course, what we care about is group objects in the category of affine schemes. Okay. So this is my second definition of a group scheme. A finite group scheme is a group object in the category of affine schemes. Okay. This is just a definition. And of course, having given two different definitions, uh, one has to verify that these agree, right? Uh, and this is very easy to do uh, in the sense that uh, I'm assuming that my finite group scheme is a frame. So it's a spectrum of some community, right? And I have this very well known equivalence between affine schemes uh, and commutative K algebras, which is functorial, right? Not only on objects, but also on morphisms. So when I apply this functor to the abstract multiplication map, I get a map in the other direction from the coordinate ring of G to the tensor product of the coordinate G with itself, which is exactly the co-multiplication map that we were seeing before. If I apply the functor to this identity morphism, I get the co-unit. And if I apply it to the inversion map, I get the other. So we recover the co-structure in the coordinate ring. The algebra structure already existed because I'm talking about K algebras. And this somehow proves, even though one needs to check, uh, check the compatibility axioms, the group actions, the group object actions in G translate to this bunch of compatibility properties that I skipped uh, for the Hoffman. So, taking a breath, in summary, we have three different equivalent viewpoints on group schemes. One is the geometric definition, group object in the category of schemes. Through the spec functor, this is equivalent 
to taking commutative Hopf algebras, k squared back to G, which by the duality argument is equivalent to considering co-commutative of algebras K. So you can start with any one of these three objects and get the other, depending on which one is your preferred definition. If you're a representation theorist, you will probably start with the right-hand side. If you are an algebraic geometer, you will start with the left-hand side. If you're a commutative algebraist, probably with the middle. So in theory, everything can be done using one group. But of course, this is not always the case, right? Um, so far, maybe people are more familiar with their representation theories. So some constructions uh, in classical uh, group theory that can be done in terms of the group algebra can be easily generalized in that context. What I'm trying to say is that one can directly define representations for the group schemes as modules for the and this is fine. Uh, or one can define the order of the group as the dimension uh, of the group algebra as a vector space, okay? or the coordinate ring, which is also fine. But there are some constructions which are more subtle, you know? some constructions which are much better understood in terms of group theory. For example, quotients, right? What is a quotient, I mean, of a group by one of its subgroups, I mean, this is a set of quotients, right? These are sets, these don't have to be Okay, you can do it in terms of the group algebra. This is like an induced module type of construction, induction that we will see in the next lecture, but still it's much more niche and clear, clearly done group theoretically. Or if one wants to talk about G sets, permutation module, orbits, semi-direct products, Stabilizers, centralizers, all of these constructions, all of these constructions are group theoretical and they don't factor through originally the construction of the group algebra, right? And so far, we have only modeled the group scheme structure on group theory, right? We cannot invoke theorems and say, aha, I'm going to use that theorem that defines quotients or some result on cosets. Um, I don't know, the double coset formula, like Mikey's decomposition formula and so on. Okay. To do that, we need a fourth viewpoint. Okay. And the fourth viewpoint is actually the most powerful one. And as is always the case with these things, it's the most absent, right? Uh, and this is the functorial viewpoint. Uh, now to motivate uh, the construction, let me just start with some examples and say that if one starts with a commutative ring R, I can assign to a commutative ring its underlying additive group, right? Simply. And then if I have a morphism of commutative rings from R to S, then I get a group homomorphism between the additive group of R and the additive group of S. The same can be done for the general linear group. I can assign to a ring the group of n by n invertible matrices with entries in that ring. And any ring homomorphism gives rise to a homomorphism of general linear groups. And the same applies, for example, to the p neutral ring. This description, this first half of this slide, really tells you that the assignment um, to each R of these groups is a functor from commutative rings or equivalently affine schemes. I'm making this identification from now on, where the values are in groups. And this is what I will be calling a group functor. Group functors are nothing more fancy than these three examples. Okay, a functor whose values are in groups. If you want to see it a bit more abstractly, okay, um, and this second description is useful for us to be able to invoke Yoneda's lemma in a minute, is that 
Group functors are group objects in the category of functors from a fine space design. This doesn't make sense to you, you can ignore it. Uh, it's just more useful for us to use Yoneda. Okay. Uh, and to you, Yoneda, I just uh, would like very quickly to motivate the construction of the functor points. Um, so if I start with a ring, a polynomial ring modulo some polynomial equations, um, and I want to study morphisms, maps from this ring R to an arbitrary commutative ring S, it's straightforward to verify that any such map is determined by the images of the XI, which I call AIs. And these images necessarily are solutions to the system of equations in the FIs. So if I take all homomorphisms from Arcturus, I can identify them with collections of elements in the ring S that are solutions to this equation. And for that reason, I'm going to call these sets home from R to S, which is of course the same as the home set in the category of schemes, the set of S valued points. Because literally in this example, these are points with values in that ring extension uh, from R to S. And the idea behind Yoneda's lemma that I will give in its most generality in the next slide is that if I take the collection of all S valued points for all commutative rings S, then I can recover my schemes. Formally, okay, formally, I start with an affine scheme. Instead of talking about the collection of all home sets, I somehow summarize this into a functor. So I take the home functor from a fine scheme set that assigns to every Y the maps from Y to X, okay, the contravariant home. And then Yoneda's lemma says that these home functors can be used to embed the category of affine schemes into a category of functor. Okay. Formally, this Yoneda functor is fully faithful, which means that any scheme is determined by uh, its functor of points. Okay. And functors that are in the image of the Yoneda uh, embedding are called representative. So here I'm giving you the third definition of a group scheme, okay. a finite group scheme over a field K is an affine scheme, an element in C that maps to a group functor, okay. that such that its home functor is not just a, a functor from, set, from C to set, but a functor from C to okay. And Essentially, this is uh, the original definition that Grothendieck and his school gave uh, when they introduced uh, the concept of group schemes. Now, this is really abstract, okay? It seems really abstract, um, but in reality, uh, we have seen these examples. So let me just go over very quickly the three examples that we saw, okay? The additive functor the GLM functor and the roots of unity functor. Okay. So really when I'm taking the additive group, I'm not changing anything um, on the ring. So the respective group scheme is just the affine line, the spectrum of a polynomial ring in one variable, with an extra group structure that does not appear when I write it like this, right? With the extra group structure that comes from this plus here. The general linear group is represented again by a group scheme. And the coordinate ring is what you would expect it to be. And you take the polynomial ring in the entries, the variables are the entries of the matrices, and you force the determinant to be non zero. 
And the roots of unity, again, are represented by what you would expect to be represented, the quotient of a polynomial ring in one variable by the polynomial t to the p. Of course, if one looks at these three definitions, then you might ask, what is the point of going into such an abstract territory and talking about these very weird and complicated functors, right? And I told you that our goal was to be able to invoke group theory. And this slide is meant to convince you. How so? Let's fix H to be a subgroup scheme of a finite group scheme. You can take your definition as the spectrum of a commutative algebra. Okay. Let X be just an affine scheme, the spectrum of a ring. And to distinguish between the schemes and the functors, I'm going to use calligraphy. So if I want to define an action of G on X, then I can simply evaluate the respective functors at rings R. G of R is an honest group. X of R is an honest set. So I'm just requiring that this group acts on itself. And this is my definition of a group scheme, which allows me to use the results that we already know from representation theory. Secondly, if I want to construct the quotient G mod H for a subgroup, again, what I will be doing is I evaluate the functor that represents G and I evaluate the functor that corresponds to H. G of R and H of R are honest groups. So I can talk about cosets, right? So G of R mod H of R is cosets. Okay. This gives me a functor. And one needs to prove, okay, it's highly non-trivial. Yeah. One needs to prove that this functor is actually represented. But the definition is somehow more intuitive, right? I'm taking re really honestly uh, cosets here. And I can do the same with stabilizer. If I have an action of G on X, as in the first uh, bullet point, and I want to define the stabilizer of a point, I evaluate my respective functors of algebras, and I take the honest definition of a stabilizer, the group elements that fix X. There are some technicalities here, Technicalities that I'm taking a rational point uh, and that, of course, G of R acts on X of R. So I don't want to, to give too many details yet. I will do so in the next uh, lecture. But the idea is, again, that I define stabilizers functorially. And one needs to prove that this functor is representable by an affine scheme. Okay. I repeat. All these are representable in our case, uh, but it's highly non-trivial to prove. Intuition, though, uh, I think is much better than uh, talking, um, than giving the just uh, um, algebraic definitions of um, these concepts, which I will do right now. So the three viewpoints we have now have been extended to four different we have the functorial view of a group scheme. By Yoneda's lemma, this is equivalent to the geometric viewpoint of a group scheme. By the spec construction, this is equivalent to the commutative of algebra viewpoint. By duality, this is equivalent to the co-commutative. And you can pick any one of the four viewpoints you want and try to solve the problems within that view. Each one has its own advantage. And it's important to understand that all concepts introduced can be transferred using these arrows from one world to the other. 
For example, an action of a group scheme or an affine scheme can be defined functorially as I defined it before. The group G of R acts on X of R for only R. Can be defined geometrically. A morphism of group schemes, sorry, a morphism of schemes. You get a map G cross X to X that is a morphism and satisfies associativity and unitality. This is just the abstract way of writing that if I multiply, if I act on X with G2, and then I multiply with G1, it's the same as if I multiply G1 with G2, and then I act on X, okay? MG is the multiplication of G, uh, rho is the action. Or you can take the spec of these bullet points, which reverses the arrow, and talk about a coaction map, from S to S tensor, the coordinate ring of G. And then you apply spec to these two bullet points and you get this. This is literally dualization somehow in terms of no, the spec construction. So M cross one on the scheme becomes M star tensor identity rho becomes sigma, 1g cross r becomes identity tensor s. Okay, this is exactly the same. But of course, you can check things using this description down here. You can pick which one of the three when you say g acts on scheme and you want to prove something. Um, in some cases, it cannot be done functorially. It must be done in terms of algebra. Of course, I'm missing the fourth point. I'm missing duality here um, because it's not so evident how you go from this construction to uh, KG modules. Okay. So I have a very small slide um, that hopefully will convince you of this or use it as a reference. <clears throat> so, what we saw before, and I called coaction, you can call it a comodule structure. So if I have a vector space M, and I have a map from M to M tensor, the coordinate ring, that satisfies these two bullet points, okay? this is exactly what I'm copying in the next slide, co-associativity co and co-unitality. Then, I can define a KG module structure for the group algebra on M. Okay. Very simply, I need a map from KG tensor M to M. How do I get it? Well, I go from KG tensor M to KG tensor M tensor the coordinate ring. Identity on the first factor, coaction M to M tensor KG. Then I switch the order, I flip. M with a coordinate ring to get this domain, co-domain. And finally, you observe that these two objects are dual to each other, right? One is functions on the other. So I can evaluate a function on an element. Evaluation is a map that takes me to the ground to OK, and thus I arrive at M. So this composition defines a KG module structure. Right? And conversely, I'm not going over the details. Okay, I'm not going over the details. Uh, if I start with the structure of a module over the group algebra, then I can get the structure of a co-module over the group. So in the end, these two concepts are equivalent. Okay, Representations for the group scheme can be seen as modules for the group algebra or co-modules for the coordinate. Careful, I'm not talking about modules for the coordinate ring, right? We're not talking about sheaves on scheme, for example. I'm talking about the co-version. Okay. Representations for the group schemes are not sheaves on the group scheme, okay? They are co-versions. 
So I will conclude in a couple of minutes. Okay. Just summarizing again what I've been saying. Four viewpoints, functorial, geometric, commutative hop, co-commutative hop, actions can be defined equivalently in four different ways. Functorial, geometric, co-algebra, co-module, or module. And this picture carries on to all the constructions that we will see in this series of lectures. For the last one or two minutes, even less than that, just as an application, okay, I want to just show you that contrary to what happens in the case of finite groups, where we have a single finite group of order P, in the group scheme world, we have three finite group schemes of order P. We have the cyclic group. Okay. Maybe I will repeat that slide okay, because now I just saw that I'm one minute over time, so I'm, I'm concluded. We have the honest cyclic group. Its group algebra is commutative, so I can take the spectrum. And this gives me a new group scheme, okay, which is somehow dual to the finite group, but not isomorphic. And I can get a third group scheme by considering the additive group and taking the elements of order. I'm rushing through this. I will repeat, thankfully, I have one more lecture. I just showing you the result, which is a big theorem of John Tate and Franz Holt from the 1970s, that there are exactly three pairwise non-isomorphic group schemes of order P. And to convince yourselves or to actually get the proof, you have to go and see Clearly, what is the functorial description, what is the coordinate rating, and what is the group algebra, and verify that these are not the same. The question of classifying group schemes of order P squared or P cubed or P to the N is a very, very hard problem, uh, which is definitely open uh, and considered to be uh, hopeless. Okay. So I think uh, I will uh, stop here. And maybe as instead of just giving some concluding remarks, uh, I'll just, uh, as always, you know, use uh, Gilbert's quotes as I did in the beginning of the lecture, uh, which are more than one century old, uh, but I think they are very relevant uh, even in the, this day. Um, the first comment is Gilbert's response to um, the reactions against Nether um being trying to be tenured okay uh, and the second one is just uh, a random quote that i found when i was looking for the first one and i just thought uh, i would add it okay so i'm gonna stop here thank you and i uh, really apologize for so thank you very much Costas, for this excellent uh, talk the first one so i will stop the the recording the video